Okay, great. Um, first of all, can people see this opening slide here? Yes. Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, yes. great. Well, thank you everybody uh, for attending. This is the inauguration of Heat Pumps 101. This is an introduction to heat pumps. Um, and this is gonna be led by myself. Um, I'm an engineer um, and I, uh, for my day job, I work for New York Clean Heat, which is an incentive program um, uh, promoting the switch from fossil fuel uh, to heat pumps all across New York State. Um, I'll be doing the fr front half of this. So I'm gonna be covering a lot, um, some basics about heat pumps, how they work, um, how to, what to think about if you're thinking about electrifying your house um, and different types of heat pumps. And then I'm gonna pass it to Sam. And Sam, do you wanna introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, sure, um, my name is Sam Krakow. I'm a, I'm a local sheet metal worker. I'm with Local 19. Uh, I install commercial and residential ductwork, and I'm also trained in the installation of uh, air conditioning heaters and uh, heat pumps, both in commercial and uh, residential settings. And since I do that as my day job, I thought I'd do it in my house as well. And I just finished up completely electrifying my house. Awesome. Um, and I'd like to thank the Haverford EAC and the Township Parks and Rec for, for hosting this, to both, both of those organizations. Um, uh, for the first, first slide, I'm, I'm gonna spend two slides just generally on electrifying your house. Um, the things that you should think about if you're thinking of decarbonizing, decarbonizing your house. Um, there's a lot more than solar and electric cars to think about. And this is a great uh, resource here, um, Zero Energy Project, which a lot of these slides are from. Um, these are the different things that you can electrify to switch from fossil fuel. Um, solar, you're probably well aware with um, Solarized Delco about that, the, the offerings we have here, electric vehicles. Um, these are all links on the um, on the, net, the zero, uh, the, the site I just mentioned. And if you click on these links, it gives you a lot of basic information about these things to put them in context of other things you might wanna do. And I've copied some things. Another big thing here is heat pump uh, HVAC, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, you can also uh, switch your water heater to a heat pump water heater or your clothes dryer to an electric or a heat pump version. You can switch your stove to an induction. And finally, you can switch your yard um, equipment so these are all things you can do. And I tried to put these in some context of how expensive it is. Um, one dollar sign here is a few hundred dollars, a few, few hundred dollars. This is a modest carbon impact here. This one tree, if you think about it, these ones all here are in the range of, you know, one to four, five-ish thousand dollars to do these kind of things. Um, with modest impacts for cooking, wash, drying your clothes, moderate impact for your water heater. All these ones up here are the heavy hitters of decarbonization, solar, electric, and heat pumps. They all are in the range of tens of thousands of dollars um, and large impacts and also complexity. Um, some things to think about um, here is you could, you could start out just decarbonizing your yard equipment um, or your water heater as fairly simple things. Um, all these things have to be balanced. Um, a lot of these things have benefits um, to, to, your, to your house. The heat pumps certainly do compared to fossil fuel, health benefits and things like that. There's also complexity um, and costs as well as carbon. So there's, there's quite a bit to be balanced.
But one important thing to keep in mind is how old is this appliance or your car? So if you have something near the end of your life, of its life, it's, it's important. It's, you should start thinking about it now before it breaks and you need a water heater at one in the morning and someone's just going to install a, a fossil fuel systems in an emergency. So this is really important. Like when things get near the end of their useful life is a really good time to seriously think about replacing, say, your furnace with a heat pump. Uh, another important thing is check out your electrical panel. How much service do you have? This is my panel here, and I have a hundred amp service here, which might not be enough for full full electrification of my house. Do I need? Do you need to have a higher? Here I have an electric car charger. I don't have a whole lot of space for for other things. Um, and in this YouTube here, we'll share these slides. Um, Nate the House Whisperer, who is one of the leaders in heat pump promotion across the country has a really great series on YouTube. And one of his videos is, let's see if you need to replace your panels. Most often, many times you don't. Um, so there's just some simple things you could do, but the reality is to replace your panel, it's thousands of dollars and there's no carbon impact, <laughs> unfortunately. And of course, the, the, the other reference here is um, Saul Griffin. Uh, rewiring America. This is a great reference on, on just general electrification. Um, I'm going to spend just a second on what is a heat pump. A lot of people may, this may be confusing. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the graphics didn't come. Heat spontaneously moves from warm to cold. I didn't know this until I was in college in, in engineering. There's no such thing as cold. There's only lack of heat. So heat will always try to move downhill, essentially, from warm place to a cold place. And all a heat pump does is move it backwards from cold to warm. Here's some examples. Your fridge is a heat pump. It moves, from, uh, it moves heat from a cold space, the inside to the outside. ACs, the same thing. And so heat pumps that we're talking about for HVAC just can change direction. And here's an analogy to water. Water always goes from high to low. So these, sorry, these graphics got scrambled. Always go from a high place to a low, but you can install a pump to pump the water from low to high. It's no different with heat. It's the same kind of idea. Um, here's, here's an important uh, point here on this next slide. Um, the technology for heat pumps has been advancing incredibly fast over the last certainly five years. Um, heat pumps can, can heat well below zero, and there's a lot of standardized rating systems, and one of them is this Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, or NEEP.org. It's a listing of heat pump models. They have to be rated down to five degrees, they have to have, be at least 175% efficient at five degrees um, to be listed here. And there's 36,000 models uh, as of this week listed there. Um, so you can see there's, there's a lot of um, innovation. Heat pumps can, can, can certainly work well down in areas that people didn't think that they could. Um, here's an example of a heat pump, a listing um, in, in that database. This is a particular model heat pump here. So it shows at different outside temperatures how much power it has and how much efficiency it has. This one at 47 degrees, which is kind of cool temperature, is, is 563 or 288% efficient depending if it's on high speed or low speed. At the, and, and this one at five degrees, if you look here, it's at 200% efficient at five degrees and 350% three, at low, the lowest power setting. And there's also a rating here, it, the performance just keeps improving 
at negative 13. Sometimes people are listing manufacturers at negative four. So people are going down in temperature for these, uh, these listings. And Energy Star is coming out with a cold climate um, label for heat pumps that is the most efficient and powerful heat pumps out of these 36,000. About 30% will make this cut as being uh, really power, the most powerful at low, po low temperatures and the most efficient. Um, so there's good, good confidence that if you do, if a heat pump is chosen uh, correctly for your house, you will not need fossil fuel. Any questions? I have a question. Sure. Uh, yeah, Steve, um, how, what is the metric for efficiency? What designates uh, a heat pump as more than 100% efficient? That's compared okay. to what? So, it, so it's, it's, it's based on the amount of, of heating or cooling um, the device puts out, moves, essentially pumps from inside to outside. That amount of, of energy, heat energy, divided by the electrical energy needed to move it. So, um, so if you have, if you say have, if you're two hundred eighty eight percent efficient in this case, it means it can put say on a winter cold day, it can for every uh, watt of power that it 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 uses, it will put. 2.8 watts of heat into your house. Does that make sense? And electric um, resistance heating, which is just like a lot of uh, ranges um, and some houses are heated with just electric wires are 100% are, are efficient. So all their electricity that goes in is converted to heat. And fossil, most fossil fuel is about 80% efficient, most uh, conventional systems. So um, that, that's how that is. And that is this measure, Harold, called COP here. So that's just really heat out divided by electricity in, in the same units. So, so this, this particular one um, at 47 degrees at low power is, you could say is 563% efficient here. At a high power, it's 288% um, efficient, okay? So that's the efficiency. Um, so now I'm gonna just go over the most common types of heat pumps. Um, air source are heat pumps that move heat between the air in your house and the air outside. So air source is where the heat will end up or, or um, be pulled from. And here's just an example. The, that picture I showed on that front slide um, shows my neighbor who just installed a heat pump. So this is the, the unit that is either pulling heat in in the winter or pushing it outside in, in the um, summer. So this is a house with ducts. So in this case, this air source heat pump is going into a furnace. So if you have a fossil fuel, um, like a gas furnace, this is a pretty, um, a pretty simple uh, retrofit to just rip out the furnace and put in a um, air source heat pump. If, you're, if, you if you do not have ducts, like you have radiators, um, you could possibly rip out the radiators and put in a ductless system. And um, in this case, there's these in interior cassettes and, and there's one in each major zone. And it's the same process here. Just the air is just moving within a room as opposed to a house. And air source heat pumps are by far the most common and cost-effective type of heat pumps. Um, ground source heat pumps, as, as I show here, are also very popular, um, but they're much more expensive and much more complicated. 
they do have slightly higher performance in air source, but as you can tell, the technology of air source heat pumps keeps accelerating. And so they're very close in terms of performance. And in New York state, we, we process about 20, 25,000 um, houses a year and about 80% are air source. Um, it's, it's just the simplest, it's the most, um, it's the cheapest to do. Uh, but in a ground source, the heat is pulled from the house and rejected to this to a loop of water that moves under underground. So this has to be installed and, and dug out here. Um, but it's otherwise the same. Any questions? So these are the most common types of heat pumps that are on the market today in the US. But as I was saying, there's a lot of innovation and I'm gonna cover this. This is a really, uh, a, a really fascinating technology that is very popular in Europe to Asia, Europe and Asia. So this is an air to water heat pump. So um, you would have your outsize, this is the heat pump and it's really moving heat into uh, a water, a water tank. So this water tank you can use for domestic hot water and, uh, or you can also use it to um, supply your radiators so you don't have to rip out your radiators. And so there are companies that are just coming into America that are very, very active overseas like Mitsubishi and LG um, who do, do these type of um, projects all over the world and are just starting to um, work in America. But this is, a, this is a big, a lot more care needs to be um, taken during design because now you have the complexity of, you wanna make sure your house is hot enough on a very cold day, but also you have enough hot water for a shower. So it's in terms of the design and the sizing, it's, um, it takes even, it's even a little more care than a regular heat pump. Here's another emerging technology. Um, I don't know if people have heard about gradient. Um, this is a window unit that is self-installed and apparently they're just starting to take reservations now. And so um, <clears throat> you can um, not even lose your window for, 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 for a heat pump. But from what I've heard and Sam just mentioned, the, the performance and the efficiency of this is not good. <laughs> it's not nearly as good as those systems I just showed where they're really designed with efficiency in mind. Um, but it certainly is, it certainly is an interesting technology. <clears throat> and finally, this is something that um, um, is also um, an emerging technology to have district wide ground source heating. So in a typical ground source um, heat pump, you have individual buildings that each have their own loops but you can also have them all on the same loop. And, and, and you can also, with this type of um, design, have put the, the wells and dig up the ground in the best place. Because um, not everyone has a, a, a yard that you could put wells on. And, um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of interest in this for, for new construction. And um, in these cases, um, very often the builder will form a utility <clears throat> for, for just the heat pumps and <clears throat> supplying heating and cooling energy to the houses. <clears throat> An actual regulated utility and own the heat pumps as well. So um, essentially taking all of this out of the, the owner's hands and pricing it just below what people would normally pay for your isolated uh, HVAC, fossil HVAC. So that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. Um, and there's some pilots going up all over the country for that. 
Um, any questions? I'm, I'm, uh, I just covered some very high level uh, material on heat pumps and the different types of heat pumps. Um, any questions before we move to Sam? Um, this isn't really a question as much as I just wanted to get your, your explanation. So in the very first slide, the opening slide, you showed mm -hmm. the look, look like the heat pump and the air conditioner. Mm -hmm. um, so like in my house, I have a heat pump that, you know, it works as the air conditioner too. Um, can you describe what's going on here? Well, in this case, um, this was, this is um, a house flippers bought the house next to me and they installed new HVAC in areas that did not have it, like the porch and the upper floor. So they put, this is a, this is a mini split heat pump. So they, they, this one, um, the refrigerant goes up here to those interior cassettes that, that, we, that I showed you. This is actually an air conditioner condenser. This is only for air conditioners. So they have a furnace going through the house um, with duct work. And so this supplies cooling to the, um, the rest of the house. But this also could be, you can't tell from this picture, this could be also an air source heat pump. This could be supplying heating too. And this is new equipment and it would be crazy for these people to rip it out now and put a heat pump in, but you could take this off and just put in an air source um, heat pump that would do the whole house for this, in this case. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So if you have something like this, it's probably the simplest, in the, and you have an air conditioner uh, furnace combination, and one or either is getting old, you should really think about, it's a great time to think about heat pumps. Um, so just again, just to drive home, there's a lot of things that you can electrify in your house, and then heat pumps can definitely meet any challenge of cold that we throw at it. Um, even up in Maine, there's a very popular program, just like New York State up in Maine, that's it's uh, driving electrification up there in Canada. Um, and there's a lot of different types. So I'm going to go now to some real world examples and uh, someone who's actually done it. And uh, Sam, take it away. All right. Well, thank you again for uh, inviting me. Um... I never thought I'd actually get to present this because I always thought of myself as that crazy guy in the neighborhood that was doing all sorts of home projects. And then I get this invitation when I was uh, on the EAC uh, by, by Steve to take a look at my house. And I said, oh, this is great. Uh, I finally get to show it off a little bit. So um, I told you a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a union sheet metal worker. I've been doing this for the past 10 years. Uh, I install commercial ductwork. I also know how to deal with the units, heat pumps, uh, heaters, air conditioners. And I have a personal motivation to do this because I'm a very, very strong environmentalist. Um, and I thought, what a better place to do it than my own house in order to try out mistakes, uh, see what would happen. Um, rather than experimenting on somebody else's house. And I found out to be it to be a very interesting experience. And I have a very tolerant wife. So uh, she was willing to let me do it. And she has her own hobbies and I tolerate her stuff. So this is my stuff. This is what I like to do. Um, and I'm also um, driven by the fact that I believe that there's much more that you can do than your, your standard buy a Tesla, and I've done my part for the environment. There's so much more that can be done. And I think this is one way that has not been expressed enough. And I believe Steve would agree that there's so much more to the environmental movement than just buying an EV. Um, and heat pumps and general electrification is definitely the way to go. And if there's one thing I could definitely hammer home is you don't have to do everything. But as things age, it definitely makes sense to look into this as you're um, thinking about 
changing out a big expensive item in your house. And heat pumps are one of the biggest ways to go because um, when you're dealing with a heat pump, you're dealing with something that Steve has already expressed. You're increasing the efficiency of an item that ordinarily would work at 100% efficiency and boost it up to 300 or 500, 600% efficiency. Because um, when you burn something, you have a lot of wasted heat and that's not doing anybody any good. But when you're transferring heat, you have almost sky, the sky is almost the limit in terms of the amount of efficiency that you can uh, boost into the items that we're gonna talk about. And they're just a lot safer. So we'll move on to my experience and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll see if uh, anybody can gain any enlightenment from what I've done. So next slide. Okay, so this is my house. You would never think anything out of the ordinary about it other than the fact that it's got an extraordinary garden uh, in the front or back. It's a 1200 square foot uh, twin house. If you know where the intersection of route one and route three is, I'm right behind the old LA Fitness. Um, if you drive by this area, it's just another unassuming uh, row house in Philadelphia and you'd think nothing of it. But this is a very special house now and I am very proud of it. Um, and I worked on this piece by piece. It was about a three year project. So um, let's go on with uh, what I did. Next slide. So the first thing I did was when I went to the rec center one day, they did a presentation on uh, Solarize Haverford. And I had looked into solar in the past and every time one of those people called up and, I, and they said, do you wanna get solar? And I told them I had a flat roof. They said, well, go screw yourself. We can't do it. Um, so it, it really drove me nuts. And then when I went to the rec center and they talked about Solarize Haverford, uh, well, have it for the Delco Solarize. Um, I told them I have a garage out and back and uh, it's got a slope roof and it also get, uh, has sun because my house has a big tree nearby and it definitely wouldn't be able to get solar otherwise because it has that, fl that flat roof and the tree. And they said, sure, we'll set you up. So the guy came down, he said, we can do it, but you got to trench out uh, a line to go all the way to the garage so that we can have access to the garage and get it to your main panel. So I said, okay, we'll do it. So in order to save money and to avoid my wife's precious garden, we trenched all the way down that side path on the right to the garage. And let me tell you, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, um, that was a great experience. I believe Solarize Delco is a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, and I think we were one of 12 families that was able to participate in that. So when we got the solar array, we were off to the races. We could actually start thinking about uh, electrifying our house. And the, the important thing about electrifying your house is, okay, if you electrify it, you're still getting your electricity from the utility. And people will always state, well, you're just burning fossil fuel somewhere else. Well, the thing is, if you have a solar array in your house, you can use the electricity from the solar array to uh, power all the electrical outlets and units that you're gonna have in your house when you electrify it. So it's a beautiful system. And also my solar array isn't big enough to power everything in the house. So you still have to remember that the utility even though it's still using fossil fuels, it's getting cleaner by the year. And over time, uh, it's gonna be much more efficient than burning anything in your house, say with a fossil fuel heater or a fossil fuel water heater uh, than, um, than any other thing you could possibly think of. And I think it's only a matter of time before this becomes the mainstay of what needs to be done in order to deal with the uh, issues of climate change. Uh, next uh, next uh, slide. So this is my electrical panel. And we talked about the fact that if you're gonna have all these electrical units in the house, you're gonna have to have some space for it. And unfortunately I did have to upgrade my, upgrade my electrical panel. I went from a 100 amp panel to a 200 amp panel. Um, yes, 
I did this all myself. Um, don't go ooh and ah. Uh, a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of asking questions on construction sites from, from fellow coworkers. It's amazing how much you can learn when you're on a construction site from people who know this stuff. So uh, this is a 200 amp panel. Uh, it has a whole house surge protector, which is that green glowing thing on the bottom. So that protects against any surges that come into the house from the general uh, grid. Uh, and since you're putting in a lot of electronics in your house, uh, heat pumps have a lot of electrical switch um, uh, motherboards, uh, very, very sensitive um, circuitry. And the last thing you wanna do is burn out all of these new electrical appliances that you're putting in your house from a surge from the general grid. So that's something you could do in general and it's not that expensive. And I would definitely encourage people to do it. Um, the last thing you want is to be calling your insurance company and saying, um, my computer doesn't work, my, uh, my house, my TV doesn't work because I came home and there was an electrical storm and there was a surge through my house. But that's beside the point. Um, next slide. So I put these in. Um, this is my first floor on my house. I have a, uh, a, a complete open floor plan on my first floor. So I'm able to supply uh, the heating and air conditioning uh, with a ductless system on my first floor. And if you look on the right, that's one of the condensers that goes to this head on the left. And that supplies the heating and air conditioning for the first floor. The basement, I have another one of these similar systems. Um, and that is also shown on the right. And that's the line set that goes to uh, the foundation that's going into the house. And on the second floor, when I was remodeling, I put in a ducted system. They have ducted heat pumps as well. So if you have multiple rooms and you don't wanna have individual heads in every room, you can also run duct work to each one of the rooms. Uh, it's up to you whether you wanna get a carpenter in there to soften off all of those ducts, or you could have exposed duct work. Um, if, you're feel, if you have a creative contractor that can come in and do that, that's also an option. Um, so there's a lot of thinking that goes on when it comes to putting in one of these units. Uh, luckily, I had time to think about it. But when you're getting a contractor and you have these multiple rooms, you got to ask your contractor, well, are you well-versed in duct work? Can you manage to get the heating and air conditioning to these various rooms with one unit and then duct it wherever you want to go or put multiple heads everywhere? Um, it does get expensive. So that's one of the considerations as well. Remember in those earlier sides with all those uh, dollar signs? Well, it's going to cost you a lot of money to do this. I did it because I wanted to do it, but these are also things that will save you money in the future as you get your heating and air conditioning bills. So uh, next slide. Ah, my dryer. I love my dryer. Uh, I got a heat pump dryer. The US is horrible when it comes to getting a heat pump dryer. I don't know what it is with US manufacturers. I could only find one. I think Whirlpool comes out with a combined uh, heat pump dryer. Uh, the dryer that I have in this picture on the, on the right, it's on the top. That's from Miel. It's a German manufacturer. Um, it's not as big as most of the American appliances in terms of capacity, uh, but it works just as well. Uh, my clothes, do not get beat up nearly as much as with an electric dryer or a gas dryer. Um, it takes a little longer to dry um, because a heat pump will take maybe about an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes to work. But I, this has got to be the best dryer I've ever had. Um, I love this thing. Uh, if I wasn't married to my wife, I'd marry this dryer. <laughs> so, so um, it also doesn't have the um, a duct, right? You don't need a duct, and there's no chance of fire, obviously, too. Correct. There is no duct work from this. The only um, right. type of attachments that you need, this one actually runs off of 110, 120 um, volts, um, not the heavy duty 220 that you're used to with an electric dryer. And you know, with uh, an air conditioner, you had that constant drip, drip, drip uh, from your unit. 
uh, and that's the, that's the humidity being sucked out of a room when you have your air conditioning on. Well, this is the same thing. Uh, the condensate from this is take, it take, it transfers the heat uh, and then sucks the water uh, in, 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 in one of the byproducts of this is water. And the water I ducted through, I, I put into a drain line and that drains into the plumbing in the house. And there's, there's no other things you have to attach. All you need is a way to drain the thing. That's it. So next slide. Ah, now this is a, a different type of hot water here. I installed this last year. This is by Sandin. You're not gonna find this um, very commonly in the United States. This is an air, this is a air to water heat pump. Um, with average uh, heat pump water heaters that you're gonna find in Home Depot or Lowe's, no, no, only Home Depot sells it, like uh, EcoTerra, um, I believe that's by Ream. Uh, they have the uh, compressor on the top of the unit. And Steve and I were talking about this beforehand. When you put one of those in your house, you're sucking the heat out of the air and dumping it into the water. That's essentially what you're doing in, those, in, in an air to water heat pump. The problem is during the winter, you're sucking hot air out of your house. But where does that hot air come from? It comes from your heater. So you're, ro you're robbing Peter to pay Paul in order to get your hot water in a hot water heat pump uh, when you're thinking about fully electrifying your hot water usage. So with this unit, the one on the right, that's the outdoor condenser. And that, and say during the winter, it's extracting ambient heat from the cold, from the air outside, even when it's down to negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and it dumps it into that tank, which is on your right, right here. That's the one that's labeled Sandin. And these things, that's the smallest tank you could possibly get, but there's one that's twice as big. And some people actually have two of those tanks together and that can heat um, radiant tubing that can go throughout your entire house and heat your house in the winter. Um, it gets more efficient during the summer because there's a lot more ambient heat in the air when it's hot and sticky and disgusting outside. So this thing, even though it's more expensive, I don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul when I'm heating my house in the winter and uh, another thing about this thing is that as a refrigerant, rather than using 410A, which is a, uh, a very, very potent greenhouse gas if it leaks, this thing only uses carbon dioxide as a refrigerant. I know it sounds unusual that I'm using carbon dioxide as a refrigerant because aren't we trying to get rid of carbon dioxide uh, for the, uh, in order to avoid the, uh, the greenhouse effect? Uh, I mean, climate change, but it's trapped within this unit. It's not going anywhere. It's used as the refrigerant. Um, but say it, it leaks and it breaks for some un unknown reason, it's not going to cause much problems. But in, an, in, a, in a, the other heat pumps that I have, it uses 410A, and that's a very potent greenhouse gas if it leaks. And if it's installed improperly and it leaks, God help us, you've lost the point of even electrifying your house because you're spewing out tons and tons of refrigerant that's much worse than your most gas guzzling, um, fuel emitting car that you could possibly imagine. So next slide. Uh, last but not least, this is my induction range. Uh, I got this baby off of Facebook. Some guy didn't wanna have this induction range because it didn't have an air fryer attachment to it. And he was willing to sell it for a thousand bucks. And I said, I'll take it because this thing usually goes for $2,700. This thing cooks wonderfully. I put some water on this thing. It boils in 50% less time than my gas range. And um, it's easy to clean. It doesn't give off any gases when I'm cooking it, cooking with it. I love it. Um, I can't really say anything else about it. It was the last step in electrifying my house. 
Except uh, your cat, your cats love it too, right? Yes, yes. When they walk on it, um, luckily there's a control. Um, there's a control lockout, so the cats can't turn it on. Um, but otherwise, um, they can't get burned either because it has to be metal, a certain type of metal. It has to be stainless metal, uh, or it has to be a magnetoferrous metal of some sort in order to allow for the magnets to heat the water or whatever happens to be in your pots or pans when you're cooking with this thing. Um, aluminum does not. So I had to get rid of some of my old pots. What a loss. <laughs> All right, next slide. So is it worth it? Economically, yes, it is if you can afford the upfront costs. And that's the problem with electrifying your house. The average person does not have the resources to do what I did because it's just so much money to put up front. And the um, the benefit, the credits and the economic incentives from the federal and state governments in Pennsylvania, there's nothing. At the federal level, it's peanuts. Um, that you really don't get much in terms of a credit on your tax returns in order to do what I did. It's only a few hundred dollars for insulating your house or putting in a heat pump or stuff like that when the costs for these things are so high, but you save on the back end. When you get my, when I get my heating bill and my, when I get my electric bill now, um, I get, 65% of all of my electric covered by my solar panels throughout the whole year. So on a non heating and air conditioning month, my electric bill is about 30 bucks. On a heating or cooling month, usually no more than 60. Um, and you have and that's no, it. Ga no gas bill too. No gas bill. <laughs> I have absolutely no gas coming to my house. The Pico just cut off my gas to my house last week. I finally finished it up. So there's no meter on my house. So for the heat pumps, I have three heat pumps. Um, just the cost for the material was about $12,000. If you were to include labor and, and the markup, from an average contractor, that's easily going to double or triple, and possibly even more considering the inflation of materials, considering the environment we're in right now, economically. And I'm sure you've heard an earful about that um, on the news. The oven was a thousand bucks. I told you about my Facebook deal. The dryer, the Miel, was about fifteen hundred bucks. I checked that just recently; it hasn't changed. The solar after. Uh, Solarized Delco came in and did that and the solar and the federal tax credit, which is being phased out, unfortunately, and hasn't been re-upped by the federal government. And chances are it won't considering what's going on in Washington. Um, that would be about $12,000 when that federal tax credit is phased out. Um, the electrical panel, when I did that, it cost about uh, $2,500. With labor and materials and everything, you're looking at about $6,000. Um, the water heater, just with materials, for me putting in was about $4,000. That could easily be about seven or $8,000. So my total was about 21,000. But like I said, that could easily be two, two and a half times with inflation materials, costs, markup, all the usual stuff. Next slide. So what are the considerations oh, uh, up until this point? Have there, are there any questions, anything that you can possibly think of that you need answered? Sam, um, I, I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, one one um, comment. Um, so I have uh, also a whole house um, surge protector um, and we did get a uh, lightning just down the line from us that and so it it blew it's it, i think it actually blew twice now we've been pretty lucky as far as lightning goes around my house and um no i guess it just blew once blew once the um and i wondered if your surge protector is before the the 
the panel or after? It, when the electricity, when the line comes in from the street, the first thing it encounters, it, the breaker is the closest one to the street line. So if your main breaker, say, is at the bottom of your panel, your surge protector should be as close, your surge protector breaker should be as close to that main breaker as possible. Conversely, if your breaker is at the very top of your electrical panel, your surge protector should be the breaker closest to the top of your panel. Uh, it's going to do no good if it's in the middle of the panel or far away from it because it's going to because electricity is always going to go through the quickest and shortest path. So if your if your breaker is nowhere near that easy path, that break that surge protector is going to do no good. Plus, okay, great. the the other thing to consider is. Once that you have an electrical event that causes your surge protector to be used, make sure that it's still useful because it's usually a one and done situation and you have to get another one. Um, if it's still lit and it's still working, Fine. that's good. So. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So when you're, this is mainly with the HVAC. Um, I, I, I have a lot of things that you have to, you should talk about when you're dealing with an HVAC uh, installation. But one of the first things you should consider when you're dealing with um, getting uh, a heat pump is make sure you maximize the insulation in your house, especially any air leaks. Um, spray foaming any air leaks, making sure you have maximum amounts of insulation in your house um, in order to make sure that you can deal with um, um, the maximum amount of air loss and heat loss and cooling loss before you get a heat pump. Because the last thing you wanna do is to deal with that after the fact, because the more you can save with the smaller unit, the, be the more money you're gonna save later down the line. Um, now, when you're dealing with an actual HVAC contractor, the first thing I would ask for is references so that you can actually check with someone who's actually dealt with these people. Because the last thing you want to do is deal with someone that has no references and, they, and you have nobody to fall back on. That, that, that's doing your due diligence. That's just basics. Now, when you're putting in a heat pump, um, the things you want to ask a contractor are, A, um, when, you, when you're doing this, um, th this gets a little technical, but I'm, and, and I know we're going through the uh, weeds right now, but it's very important to ask, and it'll probably give them a little bit of a shakeup, is do you do a triple evacuation when you're putting in your unit? Because... The one thing about the refrigerant when it's going through these lines from the condenser outside to the head that's inside and provides your air conditioning or heating is that this refrigerant cannot interact with any type of air component. And you have to get every bit of air out of these lines in order to make sure you don't have any acids building up and corroding the condenser uh, the com condenser components, because they can put it in, not do uh, an evacuation of all the remaining air in these lines. And then a few years later, your unit dies because it's been eaten through by acids formed by air that was in those line sets. Um, and if they say they don't do a triple evacuation or they don't even know what a triple evacuation is, or they just breeze through that, kick them out the front door, they're not worth it. They're going, you're just going to be wasting money. Uh, another thing to make sure is, is when they're putting in the units, make sure that they're holding an evacuation to 50 microns for an hour. What does that mean? It means the line sets do not have any leaks. These things have to be leak proof. If you have refrigerant being spewed out into the atmosphere, these things are worse than the biggest Humvee that is on the streets. Your house is not gonna be the magical environmental 
um, wonderkind on the block, it's going to be a big environmental nightmare spewing out gases that are destroying the environment, period. So you're gonna, you're gonna ask this. Another thing to ask is how do you measure the size of your unit? When you bring that unit in, how do you know what's the right size? Do they go through and find out how many insulations in the house? Do they find out if your windows are south facing or north facing? Do they check to see if you have any air leaks in your house? Um, you, you have to know whether they're doing their due diligence to put in the right sized unit. Uh, because the last thing you wanna do is in the summer, have a unit that's oversized and it shuts off when your house is cool, but it hasn't wrung out all the humidity in your house. You're gonna get that cold, clammy, disgusting, humid feeling in your house because uh, typically a, a, an air conditioner should be running almost constantly when it's on to be constantly wringing the humidity out of the air. It's not providing cold, it's providing dehumidification. It's not something that we should be taking lightly and neither should your contractor because you're putting down a crap load of money for this unit and you should be getting quality. And these people who are coming in are treating some of these installers like garbage. I know I'm talking a little union here, but they, they they pay them $15, $20 an hour. These people get trained. These people are intelligent. They're very, very smart. Um, one of the things that you'll find on a construction site is you think we're a bunch of burly cavemen, but we've been trained for years through our apprenticeships. And we know the ins and outs of what we do. But some of these non-union outfits that come in and put in units, they treat their employees like garbage. And you know, when they're putting in their units, they get, if you're treated like garbage, they're gonna treat your time like garbage. <laughs> so make sure that you're getting quality when you get your unit in. Um, I know that's, I'm getting on my soapbox, but make sure that you're doing your due diligence and it can be tough, but it's worth it in the end. Um, another thing is when you're putting in your unit, especially for the heat pumps that are providing the, uh, the heating during the winter, make sure these units are rated to a very low temperature because sometimes they have backup elements, uh, like uh, we call them toaster elements, where it gets below a certain temperature, maybe, maybe it gets below 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the refrigerant can't cut it. It can't extract any more heat out of that cold day outside. And the unit gets tired. And so the little computer inside says, okay, we can't deal with it anymore switch on the toaster and then your electric meter outside is going to start going like crazy in order to provide the electricity for that toaster element that's inside your heat pump that's just providing electrical resistance heat rather than uh, heat transfer through your refrigerant lines. Those refrigerant lines will stop and then you're going to have this little toaster element that's going to turn on and you're going to have electric bills that are going to make your eyes pop. So keep that in mind as well. Um, I already talked about the whole house surge protector, um, the GFIs, the AFIs. I've probably blown through a lot of time. This thing's getting long, so. Um, considerations, uh, water heater. I already talked about that. I love solar Delco, the oven, never end of Okay, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Okay, we are almost at time. Any any questions or comments from anybody? We will send out a link to people that have registered uh, to the YouTube and um, hopefully we can send out these slides too, if it'd be helpful to the to participants. Any comments or questions? I have a comment again. Um, I think, uh, Steve, you had, um, talk with someone who had a low, a low temperature heat pump installed by a, a local contractor. Um, do you, um, do you want to shout out that contractor as a, a place to start? Sure. Well, yeah, that was at HCAN and um, that was um, unique. Um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but they they actually put in a a a a gas furnace with the heat pump. They were oh. one of these cases where they you know they do tons of geo work and they do, but they did not have enough confidence in either themselves or the technology to do what essentially what Sam did. Um, to and and uh, so she has a very she has something that will always give her heat and not run into those problems that Sam mentioned where the the uh, the the heat pumps can't keep up if they're too small. Uh, mm -hmm. But she has a very complicated system. She's got the heat pump, and then it switches over to the gas furnace when it gets cold. And so she's got two pieces, two mechanical systems. So um, they probably could do it, but that's really all I, I know. Um, I think developing and sharing contractors that are doing quality work um, is a great idea. And I have no reason to believe that Unique wouldn't be that. But that was what happened there. So there was a question on the chat that somebody asked to get access to the phone so they could ask a question. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, we have a, a oil, oil system that heats a set of radiators and also has this different kind of water system. So you're really helping me understand that I have a lot of research to do. So thank you very much. I, and I will say that oil is the most cost effective to go to heat pumps. You will definitely come out ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I just noticed some people have been waiting in the waiting room. Okay, well, thank you all for attending. Steve, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, um, could you speak brief, briefly to the comparison of um, cost for, like if we're replacing our natural gas, as we know natural gas is very low cost, but is there any like metric that you can reference that says if the if your heating cost is this much on natural gas it might be this much with a heat pump and based on the coefficient so i know that's fairly general but is there any sort of um measure to help a consumer understand what to expect when their what their bills will be after they get something like this installed um the 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 rough calculation I've done is is it'd be about forty percent more expensive for to go to heat pumps from 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 natural gas. I don't know if other people have other experiences, but um, the the problem is natural gas per unit of energy is between four and five times cheaper than electricity by itself. And so electricity, as we as we talked about before, can be like three to you know three hundred percent efficient, but you still have a gap between that and gas. Gas is just so cheap. That's that's a big problem. Yeah. I'll, I'll chime in that that um, I have also I have solar and a heat pump, and so that's cheap together. And so maybe maybe the other uh, way we could help people understand what we're trying to do here by electrifying is to talk about the social cost of greenhouse gases. So we already know how much CO2 is causing damage to the environment and, and increased storms. But now with natural gas and methane leaks, there's got to be an even higher social cost of that, it's more and more gas than uh, is fracked and, and um, used. So maybe that's way we could help people understand the importance of electrifying and that the, the social cost that we're making a contribution rather than you know the direct investment that we're making. Yeah, absolutely. It's a no-brainer coming from oil, propane, or the, the electric toaster heating as Sam called it um, to, to go to heat pumps but but gas is a, is a challenge but um, good question 
Um, so I have a question for Sam. Are you, Sam, are you on any special Pico tariffs? I know that they have a electric heating um, tariff that, you know, this time of use tariff that apparently, you know, it, it's time to make it really cheap to run heat pumps. That's that's a whole, another wild card here um, that is not included in those numbers I gave you, uh, Bill. It's just assuming a flat rate of around, you know, um, of around seven cents for electric supply, I say. Um, but the time of use could be a big, uh, a, a big positive. It could move the needle. I, I don't think it would bridge the gap to natural gas, but it could help a lot. Does anybody here have heat pumps um, without solar on, the, on any of these Pico tariffs that would like to comment? Well, on the point when it comes to um, time of use, I don't necessarily do it because there's no need for me to get the benefits of it because I'd have to run my heat pump in the middle of the night in order to get the reduced rate. However, um, those types of uses for time of use with Pico, it's more beneficial for say, if you're charging your electric car, say from midnight to six in the morning. So. When it comes to an EV, yeah, time of use is good. But when it comes to heat pumps, you're using it during times when you're not going to get the benefit from time of use from Pico. Well, actually, most of the heating is at night when it's cold, um, you know, in the early mornings in the winter, time when that, that particular tariff is really low, um, when you need the most heat um, to heat up your house in the morning, blah, blah, blah. So. Um, I always thought that was very adv advantageous for both solar and heat pumps, but I don't really have anyone who has any examples <laughs> of it with the heat pump system. But it could it could move the needle a little bit. You could um, what Steve, I could. Oh, go ahead. Um, Steve, can you just briefly talk about the environmental benefits of going to? Um, electric appliances with our current grid makeup um, versus the uh, fossil fuels? Okay, excellent question. So if you don't have your own solar and you do put in heat pumps, um, Joy asked this question, I think like two weeks ago, it's an excellent question. A lot of our electricity comes from fossil fuel and um, so what, what is the exact, what is the carbon impact of that? So I ran, I ran some numbers and actually I checked it with other people within my company. Um, and so it depends on where you live, how clean your grid is. Where we are for Pico, you would eliminate about 45-ish percent of your heating uh, carbon impact by going to heat pumps. So it's not like a home run, it's a big chunk. And as Sam mentioned, every year that's gonna get better and better as the grid cleans up. But um, it's, it's, it's a function of how clean your grid is. In, in New York State, where I do most, most of my work, the grid is much cleaner because they use a lot of hydro uh, for the grid up there. And the, the reduction is 80% of the carbon is eliminated going from a gas uh, heating system to a heat pump. In other areas where this grid is really dirty, surprisingly like Long Island and Ohio, Indiana, a lot of places that use a lot of coal and have really dirty fuel, it's actually a wash or even slightly worse to switch to a heat pump from uh, just burning fossil fuels outright in your house. So. That's just based on purely on carbon. Um, and that's the long winded answer to your question, I think. But um, it really depends on where you live and how clean the grid is. Um, there's not, it's not a single answer for everybody, but I think everyone's expecting and hoping the grid will continually decarbonize itself. But um, who knows, you know, as, as, P, as uh, nuclear plants close down and they're replaced by gas, you know, it could even get worse in the near term, who knows? But um, we're all hoping that 
those, you know, it gets better and better everywhere. And the other part too is, is the, the health benefits. Of course, we all know about carbon monoxide in the house and the danger of, of burning things in your house, particularly for ranges. That's been really well documented lately to, um, you know, to do one thing for your health is get rid of your electric, I mean, gas range and put in either just electric or an induction range. Um, so there's, a, there's health benefits as well. I think we are, maybe one question, I think we really respect people's time and in this. Any other questions? I have I one may, more question. Oh, I have or, a question. Oh, Scott, please, please. I don't want to take up all the questions. So I'm about ready to purchase a, a mini split. Uh, I might be going in the next two weeks. Nice. And, and I have a hot water heat pump and an induction range. I did actually go with a ream and I got a fantastic deal on it. it was changing from one model to the next. I got it for a thousand bucks at Home Depot and with credits from federal and Pico was like $350. So you can get deals. You just got to watch them. Um, okay. my, my question is, um, if my kids won't be, <laughs> if my kids will quiet down is, um, I, I'm very interested in monitoring heat, anything heat pumps. So refrigerator, um, he, uh, hot water, heat pump, mini splits, and just to know if there's a refrigerant leak or when it's time to replace them or if there's some other issue. Do either Does anyone here have experience on monitoring these things and preferably not using the cloud to do it? I, there, there is a device that you can put on your, um, on your panel on the uh, main lugs that come into your electrical panel yeah. and that can then be uh, monitored through the net in order to see what the spike is in terms of your kilowatt hour usage over the day and see what you're actually uh, using on an hour by hour basis. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm putting a mini split in now. It's a ductless. I, and, and I'm not touching anything with the, the HVAC of the, the house, but I plan on putting two mini splits in, ducted mini splits to replace the, the HVAC that's currently there. And like, you know, there, there's going to be three, there's there going to be three compressors. So I guess you could put the, you, you can monitor each, each uh, circuit because it'd be on different circuits. But I didn't know if there was any kind of, there, there's there's a bunch of products out there, but I'm struggling with finding one that I'd rather not it be tied to the cloud, <laughs> if possible. I mean, I really don't care if anyone has my uh, energy usage data. It's just I don't really care of it. Everything cloud connected. I don't trust Internet of Things, honestly, for the security is the main main idea. That I don't know. Yeah. All right. I I, I use I have a sense system on my panel. And it's all cloud based and, um, you know, it's, it's really easy to use and has AI to find new loads, name them and it does segregation and all kinds of cool stuff. But uh, how does that do with like heat pumps and, and uh, such like that? Or do you have to have, I think you can actually with sense, you can get clips for each um, circuit too. Yeah, you can, you can, okay. or you can just, I, I, you know, with the heat pump, because it could be very, you know, the shape could be variable. It might have trouble picking him out and understand if you wanted to get that level of granularity, because, um, because the, one of the reasons why these heat pumps are so efficient is because they're variable speed. So yep. you have three different compressors and they could all be off and running at different speeds. So you probably would have to have separate clamps to monitor them. Um, you know, effectively. So, okay. okay, I think we should probably break here. I'm going to stop the recording.